Good afternoon, everybody. I'm Matt Harrington with the Southwestern Vermont uh, Chamber of Commerce, and uh, we're broadcasting here live uh, in, at the chamber, and we're joined with Dr. Trey Dobson, as we promised, uh, over at the Southwestern Vermont Medical Center. Uh, but before we begin, uh, I just want to say a, a big thank you to the veterans out there all across the country. Happy Veterans Day. And uh, if you can just do something, one, one special thing, one special note to a veteran today, I would encourage you to do it. So again, on behalf of the Chamber of Commerce and Southwestern Vermont Medical Center and Catamount Access Television, uh, uh, thank you veterans and happy Veterans Day. Uh, we do have to say thank you also to uh, Catamount Access Television, Cat TV, for helping us broadcast our Shire's Health telecast. Um, these are sometimes sporadic. Uh, there's not really a schedule to them, but when we start to feel that the community, uh, uh, we need to communicate some more with the community, they're asking some questions, um, things are changing in the general health and the population health of the area, specifically, you know, currently with the, the COVID pandemic, we want to be able to utilize this platform and, and, and work with the hospital uh, to answer questions. And so that's, that's just what we're doing here today, uh, your local chamber of commerce, working with our, our, our medical center. Center, and specifically their chief medical officer, Trey Dobson, uh, to answer your questions. So welcome back, Dr. Dobson. How are you? What's going on? I'm great, and it's good to be here with you, Matt. So, um, so here we are. Uh, <laughs> I think we started this maybe a March ago, maybe two Marches ago. I don't know. It all kind of blends together. feels like we've really been on this marathon, and I think you've mentioned it multiple times Um kind of during the height of the pandemic, that it's really a, more of a marathon. Um, and yet here we are even uh, kind of post-vaccine, vaccines have rolled out, kind of we felt like we were going in the right direction. And yet just like a marathon, uh, we're on mile 20, uh, it feels like of maybe 26. So talk to us a little bit in general, where we're at, if we were to take a snapshot of today, uh, specific to Southern Vermont, all of Vermont, southwestern Vermont. Where are we today from where we began? Right. Well, let me just go to more recent. I'll kind of go from the summer to now um, and just focus on that. And what we saw, started seeing in really early August, uh, late July, was a steady increase in cases. And in fact, over the past two weeks, we've had about a 50% rise in positive tests for for the virus that causes COVID-19. And, and actually, Matt, I say it that way specifically because I wanna get into what's going on now, what we need to be concerned about, but also what we don't necessarily need to be as concerned about and what is different from today uh, versus, uh, as you said, a couple of marches ago uh, on, on the calendar. Yeah. So what we're seeing is this increase in cases. It is predominantly in the unvaccinated. It's about a four or five to one uh, case of um, unvaccinated versus vaccinated. But here's one of the main differences. Um, it, at least 25 up to 30 and maybe even 40 percent of the cases are coming out of uh, those under 12 who haven't been eligible until last week. Uh, so, so they haven't been vaccinated yet. They are not necessarily getting these, uh, the virus at school, they're just getting it from being around and playing with one another. And in fact, they weren't doing that a year ago. And of course we want them to be doing that, it's critical. But unfortunately um, they are vulnerable and they're catching this virus. Then guess what happens? Their whole family is, is, uh, is contact traced. So you get the vaccinated elderly uh, um, individual in the house, you get the mom and dad, uh, or the parents, and then you get the siblings who are old enough to be vaccinated. So they all come out and they all test and they test positive because they're breathing in the, the, the virus. The vaccine doesn't prevent you from breathing in the virus. So now rather than just one or two cases, we've got four or five coming out of, of a household. And that's what we're seeing in the state of Vermont is this spread in um, what we call familial spread, spread in the family, in the homes, and fortunately, um, for the most part, the illness level is less, much less than what we were seeing uh, back in the early days of the pandemic when we didn't have vaccine. So you have the parents who may or may not uh, have mild symptoms or no symptoms uh, because they're vaccinated. You have the, um, the uh, older sibling who may have some mild symptoms or no symptoms because they're vaccinated. Then you have the child who, who gets uh, either mild to moderate or, or even quite sick uh, symptoms. They have to stay out of school. And then unfortunately, 
the elderly person that they've come across who may be vaccinated but is so vulnerable can catch the virus and wind up having some pretty significant symptoms. So what I've just told you is a, <clears throat> it's a generalization, excuse me, uh, but it's real. And it makes up uh, a large reason of why we're seeing these increased cases uh, at this time right now in, in Vermont. So is it fair to say um, a majority of, of the cases that we're seeing is from that unvaccinated child going to school, being exposed, and that's kind of what's rearing that head because there's there's other conversations going out there. Uh, you know, Vermont is is a high destination point for summer and fall travel and tourism, uh, and so there's also this conversation going out there that you know, 30 million people go through Vermont, and uh, you know, they visited over the summer and fall, and didn't that bring some of the COVID here? Uh, so just help us with some of those myths and uh, facts there. Well, um, it, it is true uh, that travel is, is how the virus spreads. If we did not travel, the virus would not spread. It would peter out. Um, so, of course, uh, when there are travel bans in place, as there were at times during the pandemic for different um, during the height of the pandemic in different locations, uh, you saw the virus um, transmission levels drop. And then people started traveling again and it increased. So that, that certainly is a source. But, hey, we have to travel. Um, we get vaccinated and it's generally safe. Uh, so to answer the question, it's very possible that um, some of the increase we are seeing today comes from travel that was about a month ago, uh, and, that, and that brought it into the area, and our own, our own citizens traveling and then returning. Yeah. Uh, so I'll kind of, I'll jump ahead here. I know we've got, you know, plenty of questions, and if you're watching on Facebook Live right now and you have a question for Dr. Dobson, please type it in the comments. We got people monitoring that. We'll try and ask those questions uh, with Dr. Dobson on the call, but to jump ahead, okay. Um, what does, what does, um, we're, we're at the 11th of November, let's get to December 11th, January 11th. Do we start to see those, those numbers go down because A, um, there's not as much travel, B, uh, we've got more vaccinations going into, into the children and C, uh, we're all a bunch of, you know, hermits when it comes to winter in Vermont, and we all like to go into our own houses and not see one another. So is there a combination of that plus social distancing and kind of face mask? What, what do you project? What do you think in the next two months for, for Southwestern Vermont? Right. Well, now you're asking me to look in the crystal ball. Uh, which I always is quite, do. That's the fun difficult. part. Yeah. So let me say this. Um, I'll start by saying vaccinating the five to 11 year olds will have a significant impact on decreasing um, transmission in the community. And, and for the reason I just said, I said one child brings it to four or five people in the family or three or four people at the minimal. And you can see if you can vaccinate that child, then you just cut out five people, right? The child and then the, and those in the family. However, we won't see the effects of this for greater than eight weeks from now um, because kids are, you know, even though 30%, which is an, a great number of um, children under 11 or five to 11 signed up in the state, um, a vast majority of them have not even received their first dose yet. They're scheduled out into the future. So unfortunately that's gonna be well into early 2020 22 before we see a decline due specifically to vaccinating the kids. But there's other reasons we may see declines. Uh, first off, there's just the fact that as we've seen with this virus, it'll saturate an area and then it'll decline and saturate an area and decline. Uh, so uh, I can't say that, that we're going to see effects from kids in the next several weeks, but we will eventually, and that'll be very welcome. And that'll actually be hopefully our last little push to get into a point where we're more steady state. That's what I like to say. We know the virus is never going away. It's always going to be here. But if we can get into a steady state where the risk is much lower for all of us, uh, then we, we truly can live with this virus just like we live with many other viruses. Yeah. And so that kind of prompts two different questions for me. And again, being I, uh, the, the layman here, um, do we ever get to a place where we vaccinate under five years old? And if so, what, why are we waiting? And if not, why not? Absolutely. We will. In fact, um, you know, hopefully by the end of January in 2022, uh, the vaccine will be approved for six months and above, uh, which is fantastic, which takes it right down to that preschool 
time, uh, that kids uh, you know, can't wear masks well. And frankly, we, we really want to get out of this phase at some point where kids can go to school and not have to worry as much. Um, so that'll, that'll happen in late January, early February, you know, potentially as late as March. And the reason why not is just because there still has to be additional testing. And let me just explain that. I'm so glad you brought that up, Matt. The testing is not um, for safety. Safety has been established. The testing in these age groups is predominantly for dosing. What dose elicits um, the appropriate response? And so you want to use a minimal dose in any type of medication. You always want to use the minimal dose for many reasons. And so they're just going to need to establish that. And that's what the trials are doing. With the uh, 5 to 11-year-olds, that's what happened too. That's why there was a delay. There was the need to establish what dose. It turned out for the Pfizer a vaccine. It was a third of the dose elicited the exact same immune response as the adult dose did in adolescents and young adults. So it was decided upon and that's what we moved forward with. Great. And, and my follow-up to there, and you kind of kind of talked about it, but we should really get used to the concept that this is going to be like a flu shot for us. We may have to do multiple boosters. We may, you know, as you go into your flu shot every uh, uh, fall to get ready for the winter flu season, uh, we may be also be doing COVID shots yearly or what does that look like? What's the future? Well, you're right that we, we may be doing that. Um, it's right now, it's unlikely to be a yearly requirement. Now I'm being careful in how I say that because we don't have the experience to really show that but just for biologic plausibility, it's more likely to be separated by years, not a year. Um, we will see if that holds. If it doesn't, then you're right. It'll be part of your annual visit to your uh, physician's office or, or just your annual uh, booster that you get um, when you're out and about and, and it's convenient. Now, the good news is, is the more and more people that are vaccinated and the more and more people that have been exposed, eventually the need for boosters actually declines somewhat. The waning of the, of the immunity in an individual uh, will continue, but the waning of the community, of the, um, of the resistance in the community will decline at a slower rate. So that's why it's more likely to be uh, measured in years between boosters rather than annually. Well, because I have you on the line here, I'm gonna ask, professionally speaking, do you, double question, do you get a shot in your less dominant arm or your more dominant arm? And what if I'm going and I'm getting a flu shot and a COVID shot, do I get them in separate arms? Do I get them, do I just kind of sacrifice the whole left side? How do you, what, what should we be doing here? Yeah, everyone's got their thoughts on this and, you know, it just ends up not really mattering that much. But if you want to be told what to do, uh, get it in your dominant arm on both on, on both shots on one side. And uh, you can tell me how it works. And then next year, we'll see if that. If that's yeah, the yeah. Answer. Great. we'll do some polling. Uh, we should put out a poll. Um, what would you uh, what, how do you get your how do you get your boosters and your flu shots? And, and what's your theory? Um, so we've got this rise, right? We've got this rise uh, in Vermont. and We've got this rise, especially in Bennington County. What does that mean for us? What should we be doing? And what does that mean even from a from a health care system perspective uh, for you? Right. So um, that's great. Those were actually two separate questions I'm going to move into. Um, so we talked about a lot during early in the pandemic, this phrase that we can't be paralyzed with the anxiety and fear uh, of these cases increasing, but we also can't be lulled into complacency. And that same phrase is uh, appropriate today, but it actually has a little bit different meaning. So when I say we can't be paralyzed with anxiety, we truly can't. We've shown that it's um, safe to go out in uh, small gatherings with family and friends without masks if everyone is vaccinated. And we should continue to do that because it's very important. Uh, but what we also have to do is respect this virus right now, that despite the fact that 79% of eligible Vermonters are vaccinated, notes that that number dropped because of the in inclusion of the five to 11 year olds now, that still leaves tens of thousands or more of people around us that are unvaccinated. And that's where the spread uh, happens much more quickly uh, for a longer duration of time. Meaning that if you're um, in a public indoor space, you don't know if people are vaccinated or not. You don't know what they've been doing or where they've been. And therefore uh, wearing masks needs to continue. Now we can drop those masks eventually, but the transmission rates have to be uh, much lower than they are. And as we've talked about, they're actually going up 
So we're not going to be doing that uh, before Christmas, uh, before the holidays. Well, and I know that we, we know it's an airborne uh, uh, virus, but the washing of hands is probably never a bad idea as we head into the winter. So uh, the, the, I, I know we've talked about that often, Trey, that that was one of those just nice little silver linings of, of the pandemic was everybody was just really healthy and even mask wearing, right? We, we should probably be getting used to wearing masks in the winter inside, generally, whether there's a, a national pandemic or not. Absolutely. And, you know, we don't have to be uh, in the future as strict. We can, we can be very specific, certainly travel uh, when you're going through an airport and in any crowded area. But if you're just running into the coffee shop where there's not that much activity, uh, right now, you still need to do it, uh, but once we get COVID values uh, less, we'll be able to, to do that. You also bring up something else. You talked about um, what's this going to mean on the healthcare system, right? And that is, boy, really important. I think everyone knows our healthcare system is strained due to two things. One is workforce issues that, of course, all businesses are facing, uh, but it's uh, pretty obvious in healthcare with especially nursing, but, but other non-clinical staff as well. And then um, the fact that Back in, in the early days of the pandemic, people weren't coming into the hospital for non-COVID reasons. Well, now the hospitals in all of Vermont are filled with patients that uh, need to be there, no, no doubt, for non-COVID reasons. So as these cases increase, and as they've increased over the past six weeks, um, we expect to see hospitalizations increase, and we are going to need to be able to accommodate them. And it's going to be, it's going to be tough. Um, we're trying to put in place plans uh, with minimal staffing and minimal resources. And then we also are really pushing treatment uh, for those people who are at high risk. In other words, they have um, a medical condition like diabetes, um, uh, lung disease, and they test positive for COVID. Uh, we can treat those patients with intravenous monoclonal antibodies, as people have read about. It's been going on around the country. It did show uh, in the trial a 70% 70 cent, 70 reduction in hospitalizations. So we've been doing about five to 10 a day at SVMC. Uh, your physician puts an order in. Uh, the treatment lasts a total of about three hours, but that includes a lot of paperwork. It includes monitoring at the end. The infusion itself is only one hour. And we need to be doing that to the, we need to maximize that, maximize the access in order to keep people out of the hospital. This um, increase with the children is uh, showing this large increase in cases, but not the same rate of hospitalization increase. So we do anticipate hospitalizations going up. It will be a challenge to handle it over the next six to eight weeks. Uh, however, it won't be at the same rate that cases are simply because of the ages of those getting sick. Yeah. Uh, let's talk a little bit about boosters. Um, we've got one question that came in, you know, who get uh, a booster shot now? And I know it's a little bit determinant of, of what you originally got uh, for, for the vaccine. Uh, is it staggered by age, uh, like the original shot? So just kind of give us an overview of, of where we're at with boosters, who's eligible and that sort of... Uh, sure. You know, well, I'm going to start by saying this is no one's fault, but it's way too complicated. It's way too complicated to figure out. Um, because I do this every day, I understand it. If I didn't do it every day, it would be too complex for me to follow too. So in general, if you got Johnson & Johnson over two months ago, you are due for a booster, um, no matter your age. So everyone 18 and older is eligible for Johnson & Johnson vaccine. If you received that over two months ago, uh, you should get a booster. For the rest, um, there's, there's the, those that are allowed to get a booster, which is anyone over 65 who had Pfizer or Moderna greater than six months ago. And then there's those that may get a booster if they want to. This is how the CDC words it. Uh, and those people are, they have um, risk factors that put them uh, you know, in jeopardy of, of severe illness and hospitalization. So if they have diabetes, immunocompromised state, cancer. Look, it's really complicated. Um, we have it on our website. So does the Department of Health. Some really good news is that it is likely that both Pfizer and Moderna are going to petition the FDA this month uh, just to allow boosters for anyone who received vaccine greater than six months ago. Um, if someone wants a booster, they probably qualify somehow. And I'm saying this out publicly. So if you're in healthcare, if you're in education, if you are in any job that puts you at increased risk of transmission, uh, you can get a booster. 
Yeah. Talk to us a little bit about, uh, we go and we get the boost. What are some symptoms we're, we're possibly uh, going to have? Yeah. You know, it's funny. It's, it's, it's so hard to predict. It's the same as, um, the, the, uh, symptoms people were experiencing from the first or their second dose. And it's hard to predict who will get them. So I'll just tell you personally, I got a fever after my first dose and had no problems after my second or third, but I have plenty of colleagues and plenty of friends. That was the opposite. I know Mm -hmm. people that had nothing from three, uh, doses total. And then people who every time were out for 24 hours with muscle aches and headache. So um, that's what we're seeing, maybe a slightly less of a reaction to the booster. uh, But for the most part, um, people will develop, uh, they'll be sleepy for the next day. They may have some muscle aches and they may even mount a fever. It's almost universally less than 24 hours, uh, most less than six hours. uh, But everyone knows that one person who was out for two days and, um, you know, even that as terrible as it is, is so much better than the risks involved with COVID-19. Yeah. And, and, and here's my non-medical advice. Take it easy. Take the day off. <laughs> Take right. the night off. Uh, maybe get at the end of the day so you have a whole kind of uh, 12 hours to recoup. Uh, I, I've received my booster um, and, and that's always my motto is just, hey, take it easy. Um, get comfortable. Uh, as you said, uh, Dr. Dobson, so much better um, than getting COVID. So, so make sure that, that you're in line to get that booster. Let's talk, let's, you talked a little bit about the staffing and the infrastructure and the system, the, the actual health system. Uh, how are you guys doing? You guys must be busy. I know there was a, a huge amount of, of kids over the last uh, week. How did that go? Talk to us about how are the operations going? How are the kids doing? What's going on at your campuses? Yeah, great. I'll start with um, our COVID Resource Center. So our COVID Resource Center, which is up at Southern Vermont College, uh, provides both um, vaccines, initial vaccines, boosters uh, to five and above, and and then also testing. And there's a big demand for testing. Anytime the transmission of the virus increases, there are uh, increases in testing. So I I kid you not that in early July, our testing average was 15 a day. And we are now averaging close to 400 a day uh, with some days, you know, near 500. And so that takes a lot of staff, a lot of resources. You know, these staff are typically in the hospital taking care of patients or in offices taking care of patients. And now, you know, they're working double duty. They're working extra time so they can staff both places because right now things at the hospital haven't stopped. We haven't stopped um, surgeries. We haven't stopped Uh, the emergency department. We have had to make some changes in some OR schedules at times to accommodate staffing, but we haven't had, you know, delays of more than one week uh, for people getting their procedures. So the the COVID Resource Center is working really well. I think the community has been very patient. They know that if they present uh, right as the doors open, that there'll be a little bit of a wait, uh, sometimes even as long as an hour, but hey, that is not bad. They're going to be getting great care, great, uh, they got choice of vaccine, Uh, given by doctors and nurses, you know, stuff you're not really seeing in many parts of the country or in the state. And then testing is drive-through. And even when the line is incredibly long, uh, people notice, hey, that only took 20 minutes to get through. And then we're getting results to folks um, 100% of the time within 24 hours. And then many of the results are coming back within eight hours. It can be texted to their phone. And now we've got a really slick system on the web where you don't need a password. You don't need anything special other than your social security number, your date of birth, um, and your zip code. And it'll pull up the result of your test for you. So that that part's going excellent. Um, The hospital is going well too, but I can tell you that the staff are stressed. Um, Every day we have... Uh, what I'd call an urgent meeting to figure out how we're going to staff parts of the hospital. Um, nursing has been incredible. The doctors have been incredible. But every day it, it comes again. It's a new day. Every day we have to figure out how are we going to staff the night shift? How are we going to work through the ICU um, volumes? And that's what concerns me for the next um, four to six weeks. If we see increases due to COVID, um, increase in hospitalizations due to COVID, you know, we're going to have to reduce some of our services elsewhere so that we have the staff to provide uh, resources needed. So for the community, um, you know, please, uh, everyone's working hard outside of the hospital. All businesses are working hard, whether you're in a coffee shop, a ski shop. Uh, we all know that. But if you do see healthcare care providers, uh, uh, be patient if you have to wait and please thank them. Yes. 
Yes, and maybe just maybe buy them a cup of coffee if you're waiting in line with them. Um, it, you know, what's fascinating, uh, Dr. Dobson, is just kind of, and I'm just as a scientist that you must be thinking about, just the sociological things you're witnessing, kind of, you know, sociology being kind of the mass study of people and like what happens when mm-hmm. you know, we have these highs and lows in our, in our communities. I mean, can you just make a comment and uh, you can look at your staff as kind of that, that microcosm. You can look at Bennington County as that microcosm. I mean, what are some ahas for you over the last two years as you've kind of watched this mass move back and forth between safety and, and then concern? Right. Well, you know, What I've seen are groups of people who um, discount their own individual wants and needs and step in for uh, the community, which, of course, uh, is compromised by their uh, or or is made up by their friends and their family. And they know that. Um, And it's beautiful to see. What's hard to see is that every person is uh, vulnerable. And at some point, these highs and lows bring you down. And we have to help each other in those situations. Um, As the anxiety increases, um, so does the turmoil in people's personal lives, uh, as well as their work. And um, being patient with one another, supporting each other is incredibly important. And I tell you what it else does, it prevents division. And we've seen a lot of division in the country uh, throughout this pandemic. And and we, we won't survive like that. We have to support each other. We have to recognize different viewpoints. Uh, and focus on a community effort. Yeah, thank you. Uh, good, good, good phrasing there. Good word and, and good encouragement. Uh, you might have answered this before, but I just want to point out uh, specifically when. Uh, how many tests are you doing at the at the COVID Resource Center, and how many vaccines and boosters? Maybe we can break those into three. Let's take per day, um, kind of uh, testing, vaccines, and boosters. Sure. So uh, for the audience there, um, the hours at the Resource Center are, are on our website. Um, I'll tell them to you now, but they can change. They change with demand. Uh, we are generally open Monday through Wednesday from two to six, so four hours, and then Thursday through Saturday uh, in the morning time uh, up until noon. So please check those hours before you come up because I, I know it's so painful to get somewhere and realize they're not open. You know, we're doing around 400 um, tests per day, some days higher than that, some days a little bit lower. It's through a drive through process. Uh, you can register online and you can also just come as a walk in. We split the lines up. Uh, where you, uh, it should be called a walk in, it should be called a drive in because you don't have to get out of your car. Um, and so you have two lines, one are people that have scheduled and one are people that didn't have the opportunity to schedule online and they're just coming up. Both do move pretty quickly, especially after that initial bolus of everyone waiting at the time of the opening. Every day we think, how can we improve this? How can we make it more efficient? And just even yesterday, we, we trialed a, sort of a third line where people uh, did the swab themselves. You know, a lot of kids are used to doing the swabs themselves and some people are used to it from their workplace. So that's the um, testing. And, and I imagine testing, Matt, is going to continue uh, for another 120 days uh, for sure. Um, you know, we'll do it as long as we need to. But at some point, uh, the, the need may drop off. Now, vaccines sort of different. So we're at a real high point right now where everyone is coming in uh, for their booster. Uh, so every day we have a line that's people getting geared up to come in. Most people have registered, but we have a pretty good number of walk-ins as well. We can accommodate both. And we're doing between two and 400 of those um, of those boosters. I would say uh, a vast majority are boosters because this community is so vaccinated, uh, but we still continue. Yesterday I, I vaccinated, I was up there for the whole time and probably had at least five or six people that was their first time to be vaccinated, uh, mostly due to mandates from work. Although I will say they all seem to be pretty excited uh, to finally have this decision and be moving forward. Great. Um, as we head into uh, the Thanksgiving uh, holidays in the next couple of weeks. And obviously that then leads us into the, uh, the, the December holiday season. Uh, recommendations that, that you want to talk to the community about masking up, visiting families, social distancing. Um, what, what should we be preparing for over the next six weeks? Sure. 
I, I'll say that, you know, a lot of people wanted, and, and early in the pandemic, we did try to really prescribe, you know, directions and, and recommendations and guidelines, but it, it's all about your own risk assessment. So it's really looking and saying, what's high risk, what's low risk, and then what can I afford as a person, especially at this point when you may not have seen your family for, for two years or seen certain fam- certain friends or at least had everyone together. So I put it this way, if you are high risk, in other words, if you are elderly um, or have a significant medical conditions, you still need to probably stay away from gatherings this year. There's just that there's too many uh, young kids that aren't vaccinated and the prevalence of the virus is too high. And that's hard for people to hear. Um, they may say, I don't want to stay away, but I understand what, what you're saying. Maybe we'll just visit and stay outdoors on the porch for that, uh, for the Thanksgiving and then let everyone else have have the indoor dinner. And that's a great idea too. As far as uh, younger folks who are um, parents, uh, uh, kids that have been vaccinated, if you are in a small group of people, when I say small, 20 people is is small, uh, friends and family that are all vaccinated, you can safely be together uh, without masks and enjoy your time together, recognizing that there still is a small risk of, of catching the disease. Now, it's unlikely you'll get sick because you're vaccinated beyond a day or two of an inconvenient uh, fever or headache. And it's also unlikely that you'll spread it uh, to the point that you develop a cluster or an outbreak. So there's that risk there. So for everybody I just said this to, if everyone on this audience goes out and does that, there will be a couple of families where, where a few people turn positive. Um, so you have to figure out whether or not that that, that risk is, is for you. We, we have to accept a certain level of risk. We have to do what we can to prevent severe infection. So we're doing that with with vaccine. What what I'd like to talk about in a minute are upcoming treatments uh, that should be out within the next few months. So we balance that with being reckless, right? We don't run around unvaccinated. Uh, We don't go to indoor concerts unvaccinated because the risk there is just too high. Yeah, so let's go right there. Exciting news with new developments coming out. Uh, I had COVID pill on my list of, of questions. Uh, so uh, what, what do you see on the horizon? Right. For outpatient treatment, so I'm not going to go into the inpatient treatment in hospital because that's a totally different realm. But for those that are outpatient, it, um, as I said earlier, and I'll just start off again with this, if you are uh, exposed or if you actually test positive for COVID and you have a... Um, underlying medical condition that puts you at high risk for uh, developing severe disease and hospitalization, then you can be treated as an outpatient with intravenous monoclonal antibody. Again, it's great because it has been shown to be efficacious, uh, but it's not sustainable for our society. We can't have all of these nurses and doctors putting IVs in to treat people. We don't have the resources to do it. And plus it costs a lot of money, maybe not necessarily to the individual receiving the treatment, but to society in general, all of the manufacturing, the storage, keeping it at the right temperature. So we have to move to that next phase, which is oral treatments, oral treatments at home, just like we have for influenza, uh, some of the uh, other viral illnesses where we have treatment in the form of what's called antiviral medications. So there's two that are going to go up to the FDA real soon. Uh, When I say real soon, within 30 days for one and within 60 days for another, both of these pills are a little different. One is an oral monoclonal antibody. So just like the IV monoclonal antibody, it's a, a protein that binds the virus in the bloodstream or elsewhere in the body and then renders it useless. Then there are uh, some other um, antivirals on, that are being announced. You probably heard of one by Pfizer that showed it was uh, highly efficacious, and that's called a protease inhibitor. That inhibits the virus from replicating, so also rendering it uh, useless in the body eventually because it doesn't replicate enough to cause disease. If we can develop a system where people are vaccinated at the, at the maximum amount that we can get in society, And then we have a vulnerable person who develops COVID, whether or not they are vaccinated, uh, then we can give them this medication. They can get a prescription, hopefully from a centralized place. So we're not flooding the doctor's office, but more of a centralized place, just like we do vaccine and get that treatment going. It's uh, four pills twice a day for the monoclonal antibody for five days. And then the other one hasn't really been announced how you would take it, but it's also probably going to be twice a day pill for about four or five days. Uh, those things together, vaccine, 
uh, wearing masks in the winter in closed spaces uh, when necessary, and then the use of these uh, oral medications will really help us live with this virus just like we live with, with the flu. Well, uh, we've got, I think, five more minutes with you, Dr. Dobson. So, one, if you're watching on Facebook, thank you for tuning in. Thank you for sticking with us. Such good information. Always love the updates. Uh, they're timely and they are to the point, and, and I so appreciate them. Um, but if you do have a question for Dr. Dobson, we have him for about five more minutes. Uh, you know, I have a wrap up kind of question. You've been doing just all this great uh, work around your new emergency department. And so, we did want to make sure that we asked you. Um, how is that going? Uh, we know you guys, I think, broke ground a couple weeks ago. Uh, and so give us an update there. All right. If you come onto campus now, you'll start to see we did break ground. We are starting the process, which is going to be 18 to 24 months of um, redoing the lobby, uh, increasing some services there and then redoing the emergency department. So um, if you look structurally, you won't see anything different today, but you will be able to real quickly. Uh, the fences are up, the parking is changed. Of course, changing parking always is frustrating to, to patients and to staff, uh, but we have to do it. We have some uh, different ways to find uh, how you're gonna get to the des your destination, whether that's the outpatient uh, or the emergency department or the inpatient. And it's gonna be great. It's gonna be, um, I wouldn't say tough, it'll be challenging. What we're gonna do is we're gonna build a new emergency department. Uh, then we're gonna move everyone into the new emergency department. Then we're gonna re, um, redesign and refurbish the old emergency department, combine them together, and, uh, and it's gonna be great. I mean, the community needs a larger emergency department. Uh, the, it was built you know, for 15,000 visits a year and we're at about 25,000. Yeah, well, we're all we're all rooting for that. You know, I think Bennington, uh, the town and even the county is really going to, through some transformative things. And it, it only makes sense that that the health system should transform with the growing county. Um, we know that we've seen a lot more, um, you know, new residents here, too. I just got new numbers a, a day ago, of just really uh, somewhat staggering numbers when you compare it to there's only you know I think 30 or 40,000 people in Bennington County so we, we've added a lot of new people many new people and 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 we need to serve those people as well so uh, a final question for you Dr. Dobson a fun question um which maybe we'll, we'll, we'll tack it on to with another question what is your favorite Thanksgiving dish <laughs> and what are you most looking forward to this holiday season this Thanksgiving well, so uh, my, my favorite Thanksgiving dish is, is uh, anything that my wife serves. How's that? Good answer. Good answer. And what I'm looking forward to, I'm looking forward to spending time with my family, getting outdoors. Um, I'll work a little bit and alternate uh, with some good mountain runs with my dogs. Awesome. Awesome. Well, I want to thank you, Dr. Dobson. I want to thank uh, Southwestern Vermont Medical Center and the whole health system, uh, Catamount Access Television. I know we also broadcast this on GNAT, so we thank the team up there in GNAT as well in, in the Northshire. Uh, and uh, for everybody watching on Facebook and, you know, he here's uh, uh, one request I would have is if this answered some questions for you, uh, if this made you lower maybe some of the anxiety you had, could you share it on your page for other other people to find it and watch it and maybe uh, help answer some of their questions. That would be the one request. So if you got information out of this, uh, share it on your personal uh, page or, or on your company page if there are questions. Of course, the hospital always uh, ready to serve you. Uh, make sure you check out their website uh, for updated information. And on behalf of the Southwestern Vermont Chamber of Commerce, I want to wish everybody uh, a very happy Veterans Day and have a great uh, rest of the week and weekend. Thank you very much.